Hi, I'm Ryan Stitt, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece. We are taking a break from our regularly scheduled programming for another special guest episode in a series where I converse with classicists and ancient historians about either books or articles that they have published, their current research interests, or just unique classes and topics that they are teaching and exploring further. In today's special guest episode, I am joined by military historian Mark DeSantis. He is the author of Rome Seizes the Trident, a book about the rise of Republican Rome's naval forces, as well as over 200 published scholarly articles that have appeared in a wide range of international publications, including MHQ, Military History, Ancient Warfare, Military History Monthly, History of War, and Ancient History Magazine. In addition to his historical writings, Mark is the author of The Memnon War, a series of science fiction novels, and he teaches English at St. Peter's University. Mark's most recent book, A Naval History of the Peloponnesian War, will be the topic at hand today. So without further ado, here's our conversation. Ancient Greek history is not an easy thing to wrap your head around. This is a whole bunch of different phrases, terms, uh, unknown things you never knew about. No matter how much you read, you say, I never heard about that. Much of ancient history in general, but you know, ancient Greek history in particular, uh, is because the written materials are sparse, or if they survive, they post-date the events they're talking about by centuries. Uh, that is, the, the reliability of those sources is open to question. Right? <laughs> that, it, that doesn't mean that it's wrong, but it's open to question. I, I would wish that we had the materials that very soon after the events in question. Mm-hmm. So in that regard, Thucydides, I think, is, is really wonderful that way in the context of the Peloponnesian War. Mm-hmm. At some point, ask me if this was one war or two. That mm-hmm. might be a good question to start out with <laughs> Okay, as, as an intro question. Okay, we'll, we'll start out then. <laughs> so what are your, you, you seem to have strong opinions. I did write the book called A Naval History of the Peloponnesian War. So <laughs> <laughs> I have strong opinions now, Ryan. <laughs> Uh, okay, yeah, so I'm assuming you think it's just one continuation of a war? No, I, I, I think you could have strong opinions on either side, but what I think is is that the Peloponnesian War can be viewed as two separate wars with strong support for that uh, position because there was a peace treaty that came into effect, 421. For the most part, there was a true lull in the war from a about that time until uh, roughly 413 BC, while the identity of the parties in each war, you know, the Athens and Sparta, were the same, which is why Thucydides treated the conflict as one war. I think that the focus of the war shifted to the Ionian islands and Asia Minor, and that's why I think Ionian War is the best term for it, and that's really a, a different kind of war. So my idea is is that the Athenians they fought a war from 431 to 421 when they have their peace, the Peace of Nicias, and the uh, Athenians won that, and then went on to do their various things, their misadventure in Sicily especially, in which they uh, brought some real grief down upon themselves. And then the war started up again because uh, all of a sudden, after the disaster in Sicily, Spartans and the other Peloponnesians saw that the Athenians looked vulnerable, and that's what encouraged the Spartans to resume the war against the Athenians. That is, they thought that they could actually now had a chance, and they started building a navy to actually take the war to the Athenians at sea. And that was where things started to go it ultimately downhill. Now, the Athenian Empire was very strong, and it took years before the Athenians were finally defeated. But once that war shifted to the Aegean Sea, and they, ultimately the target became the Hellespont, which was the lifeline of Athens to the food that would bring in from the Black Sea, as Athens and Attica couldn't support itself on the agricultural produce of, of Attica, a part of the population that was much too large for them. They have good red clay, though, just not very much arable land. <laughs> <laughs> not enough arable land. And they they uh, they had possibly around 500,000 people roundish in Attica at this time, which, which didn't have the, the proper soil. I, I would say that the analogy that I would give to Athens in the Peloponnesian War was that of Britain in the First and Second World Wars. That is, it's very wealthy, very powerful navy, but its population can't be sustained on the amount of food that can be produced in that country on its own. Athens needs food to support its population. And because of that, the navy was critical to making sure that this, uh, the lifeline through the Black Sea, which is where they were getting the bulk of their imported food, was kept open. As long as the Athenian navy could not be challenged, they were 
safe and immensely powerful. When the Peloponnesians, led by the Spartans, managed to uh, attack that lifeline and sever it, that's what spelled the doom of Athens in the Peloponnesian War. And it was uh, it's a remarkable thing because it was very early on understood that this was the jugular for Athens or Achilles heel to the ancient Greek reference. But it took a long, long time for them to actually make a very strong concerted move for a number of reasons against the Hellespont because, well, first, and this goes to the beginning of the war, the Spartans had a very, very limited navy. They, they, the Peloponnesian fleet, the bulk of the ships that were provided to the Peloponnesian League fleet at the outset of the Peloponnesian War, starting in 431, were contributed by other states. Yeah, primarily Corinth, which had an excellent navy, an excellent navy, and was a big rival of Athens. The Corinthians hated the Athenians, but the Corinthians had an excellent navy. Uh, the Spartans themselves were a land power. That, that goes without saying. The Spartan hoplite was considered to be the best hoplite in ancient Greece. They were the, the terrors of the battlefield. The one thing that you knew about facing the Spartan army in battle is that you didn't want to do that. And at, at, at the right, right before the war breaks out, Pericles of Athens, who's the uh, foremost uh, statesman in Athens, he, he lists the various advantages that the Athenians had, and he decides as part of his strategy, we're not going to give the Spartans the battle, the land battle that they seek, that they crave. Because if we go and fight the Spartans in a, in a battle on land, hoplite to hoplite, they'll win. He, he just assumes they are going to triumph in that battle. That's their fight. And the Spartans know that they are very confident that they could win any land battle they ever go into because, well, first, the Spartan uh, hoplite has been training since childhood to be a warrior. The Spartans themselves, because they are the only true professional warriors of ancient Greece, in the sense that that's their job and that's it, they can do things on the battlefield that others can't. And it's apart from their superior discipline, they also have the ability to maneuver uh, better than uh, a, a mob of artisans and farmers who've come out essentially as the you know, part-time militia for the summer, right? Uh, that they have this, they, they are just better. Pericles says, we're not going to do that. We are going to retreat behind our long walls. So let me explain what the long walls are. There's walls around the city of Athens proper, but there's also uh, the long walls that stretch from Athens to the Piraeus uh, that that protect like that land that uh, because Athens is actually uh, several miles inland, it's about three and a half miles inland from the city. Uh, so the port of Athens is actually Piraeus. That's where the ships come in exactly. And what the long walls do is is that it makes it impossible for an enemy army to cut Athens off from the sea by either investing Athens or investing Piraeus. Ancient Greek siege techniques were really they were nothing like the, what the later Romans had. Uh, so uh, fortifications were virtually impregnable. Not completely, but virtually impregnable. So it could be as, uh, assumed on the basis of the limited siege craft of the ancient Greek city-states and their, their armies, that if you had a wall, you were safe from, generally safe from being overrun. The Athenians, therefore, by building the long walls uh, between Athens down to Piraeus, uh, which protected their lifeline to the sea, they effectively made themselves into an island. So going back to the analogy with uh, Britain in the First and Second World Wars, you, you can't assail Britain without having some sort of uh, ability to cross water. Because Athens, even though it's on land and it's, it's you can actually get to Attica via land, because of the long walls, it had made itself into something of a, an island and was therefore deeply uh, secure behind those walls. The key was, as long as the Navy was superior to anything else, they were going to be able to protect that uh, lifeline to the Black Sea from which they imported food and they could sustain their population. Without that food coming from the Black Sea, they would not be able to feed their population, and they would experience famine relatively uh, quickly and eventually starve. I, I, would, I do want to point out, just uh, for the listeners, uh, the, the walls weren't just walls either. They did have like defense like posts and archers, like 13,000, I think, is what the number was, according to Pericles. So they like they were heavily defended as well. 
their siege warfare did improve a lot over the Peloponnesian War, but Athens was by far the most heavily defended, and it was basically impenetrable, unlike, say, like Plataea or Delium or something, uh, a few of the places that got ransacked from sieges. Uh, but yeah, just, just want to point out that it wasn't just walls uh, for that protected them as well. They did have their defenders on the walls. Athens did have a large army, and an effective army, and, and Pericles even lists these. We have this many uh, hoplites, and we have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Athens, the idea is we could actually pay, you know, uh, pay for the fleets and pay for the hoplites. We're very strong. He just didn't see Athens' strength as being in land combat relative to Sparta, which, once again, people were intimidated by the Spartans, and therefore uh, the idea of Pericles' strategy, one of his components was, do not give them the land battle that could lose the war in a day for us. That's that's one of the major differences that uh, that you can see in a lot of good like strategical leaders is a uh, level of self-awareness that uh, Pericles had um, in, like, I'm not going to try and turn my weakness into a strength against somebody else. I'm never going to be as good as them in such a short period of time. So I'm going to focus on what I'm good at and exploit my strengths and limit my weaknesses. And that is correct. And Pericles correctly deduced that Athens' great strength was its navy. Mm -hmm. And the advice that he gave to the Athenians, now bear in mind, when I say the advice that he gave to the Athenians, it's it's like anything that is said inside of Thucydides' in <laughs> speeches that he created. That is, we can say Pericles said this, and, and probably there was something very similar said, we're hoping, but Thucydides, speaking through the mouthpiece of Pericles, uh, in the sense that, so take it for what it's worth, uh, Pericles said, we have the money uh, and the resources uh, to pay for these fleets, we've got the best fleet, We've got talented rowers. No one else is going to be able to challenge us at sea because being a superior rower, it takes time. You can't just put a body on a seat and expect them to be truly proficient. I mean, you can do that, but they're going to be clumsy handling ships. So he says, we are, we have an advantage over everybody else at sea. What we can do is, is we creep behind our long walls. Don't worry that the Peloponnesians are going to come in and burn down our farms, burn down our houses. We replace houses. We replace farms. With our fleet, though, what we can do is, because we have this this mobility, we can attack the coastline of the enemy, harry him, and do damage to him, uh, land where we choose. And in fact, that's the strategy that they follow uh, outside of the war, and what we call the Archidamian War, named after the Spartan king Archidamus. The ability of the Athenians to make naval raids, or descents sometimes it's called, upon enemy territories was unparalleled, and it meant that almost every part of Peloponnesus was vulnerable to attack because you could actually land troops and do some damage, then leave. It would be theoretical, but do we know like how, like roughly how far into the interior they would have been able to attack? Not too far. It's, it's probable that if you were a few miles inland, you considered yourself to be safe. That means if, for example, it's a naval raid where they're not planning to land a large expeditionary force that will strike out at some target and then stay for a long time. Uh, if, if, if it was an expeditionary force, well then, and they would actually leave the ships and, and march deep inland. And in this regard, I'm, I'm thinking of, this is the attack on the city of Sardis in 498 by the Ionian Greeks. They beached their ships and then marched pretty far inland to attack the city of Sardis, which was the capital of the satrapy of Lydia in the Persian Empire. That could be done, but for the most part, these were uh, raids that they would land, attack the territory about their beached ships, and then get back on. I would imagine you would need to leave a force to guard such ships. And it would have been required a, a force of, sh of people to guard it, because, and this is, uh, again, with the, the difficulty of, of the source material, often... You know, I'll talk about a raid, and I'll mention the number of ships that were involved, but it, it really seems that they're almost always just counting the number of triremes that made the attack and not, uh, say, troop transports or horse transports with them. And there probably were if they were landing a large number of soldiers, because the, the oarsmen themselves were probably not go going into battle themselves. That is, they were not trained as soldiers, they were not hoplites typically drawn from the lower classes. They were called the Petes. They were good oarsmen in the Athenians, but they, they were not uh, soldiers who would fight in a stand-up battle. Until the end of the war. <laughs> Until they were armed at the end of the war. <laughs> we'll get there. Right, and, and then and it becomes a different story. But for the, at the beginning of the war, in the Arcadamian War, is that the uh, rower was 
he he rode and the hoplites fought and that was the distinction in yeah they don't really mention there's only a handful of times i can think of where thucydides mentions specific transports obviously the sicilian expedition and there's horse transports but it's well, we know that they existed the hoplitogogos and the hippogogos i think so in order to for example in order to get to sicily you had to bring many hoplites and, and horses and what have you and almost certainly if you're looking to besiege a town you need soldiers foot soldiers to go with you and these troop transports and horse transports would have been older triremes that were past their service life they were too old for naval combat, but they would do pretty well as, as a means of conveying troops ashore. We'll, we'll circle back to that because I want to have some questions about the triremes. Right, right. Uh, what, no, what, one more thing is that uh, Sparta's strategy was initially predicated upon the idea that they would actually get to fight this one big battle, clobber the Athenians, and the war would be over. They marched into Attica and conducted uh, destructive raids on territory there. What surprised the Spartans was that the Athenians didn't come out to fight. That is, they were attacking their farms and, and homes and didn't come out to defend them. So the idea among the Spartans was that you defended your territory, you defended your lands, the failure of the Athenians to come forth and battle in defense of their lands was a, a deep surprise to them. And because of that, the Spartans from very early did not really intellectually comprehend the kind of war that they were fighting. They didn't understand the kind of war that the Athenians were going to fight. And because of that, they didn't have much of a strategy beyond, well, let's go and try and defeat the enemy in battle. It took them a long time to figure out how they were actually going to continue on with this conflict. And in fact, the first part of the war, the Arthagamian War, they uh, really fell to pieces toward the end because when the Athenians were able uh, were able to uh, create a naval base, basically a small fortified place at Pylos, the Athenians tried to eject them and fell. They fell to capture Pylos, and they managed to strand 420 of their own Spartan citizen hoplites on the island of Sphacteria. And they surrendered, which shocked all of Greece, because the one thing that Spartans never did was surrender. And they did because they had no chances of fighting. And the Spartans then spent the next several years, from 425 until there was actual peace of Nicias, they spent a lot of time just worried that the Athenians were going to execute their citizens. They were trying to do anything to get them back. Reading Thucydides and kind of the beginning part of Xenophon, I kind of get the sense that the Spartans were extremely naive about uh, what it was going to take to win the war. Because you get like that point, and uh, it's like right after the oligarchic coup and the restoration. Thrasyllus defending the walls. Put a little head now, but Aegis was at Desolate and he came down and, and raided the, the area and then he got pushed back. And then Aegis sees these ships leaving the Piraeus and filled with grain. And he finally realizes that what they're doing is by raiding Attica is fruitless. And it was like, did it really take y'all that long to realize this strategy? Well, I think that there was a lot of muddled thinking on the part of the Spartans as to what it would take to actually win a war against Athens. That is, Athens was not, at the outset of the war, was not a mainly a land power as Sparta was used to dealing with. It was a maritime power. It fought a maritime war. When Aegis saw that the grain freighters were bringing food in to the Piraeus, he says, what is the point of what I'm doing raiding Attica as long as those freighters are coming in? And you might even say, well, why is it that the Spartans didn't make a move against the Hellspot immediately to shut down most of their food. And it was probably too big an idea for the Spartans because it would have required them to effectively do this. We're, uh, we're hoplites, we're land power, but now we have to build a navy, which we've never done before. We've never had some large enough navy. Fight the enemy at sea uh, in order to cut off the food coming from the Black Sea. That is probably something that I mean, some of them may have grasped, but they presumably said, well, our strength is in land combat. Perhaps we can win the war that way. The, 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 the muddled thinking is a major part of Thucydides' narrative of how the Spartans fought the war. So, for example, 425, a uh, Persian ambassador right, was on the way to the Spartans, and the, one of the messages that was uh, intercepted was that the Persians were frustrated. It was a message from the Persian great king, Artaxerxes, saying to the Spartans, until you can tell me exactly what you want and what you're prepared to do, in order to get something from me, I can't help you. And what that shows is that the Spartans themselves, while they would have liked support, 
they didn't know what they really wanted to do, how to, what their strategy was, how to fight the war beyond the wars could being continued. Even after the operation shifted to the Aegean, so 413 and afterward, the Spartans themselves, there, there was a lot of muddled actions in that period because they had at least two proposals coming from Persian satraps as to where to now conduct operations against the Athenians in the Aegean region. One was from Tisaphernes in Ionia, where the idea was there was a rebellion in Chios and they were going to fight in Ionia, supported by the Persian satrap. The other proposal came from Pharnabazus, another Persian satrap. He was the Persian satrap of the Hellespont region. Tisaphernes was the satrap of Lydia. Uh, Western Asia Minor. Well, ultimately, this, the, the Spartans did not get along with Tusaphanes at all. The two satraps did not like each other. <laughs> no, they, no they, they didn't care for each other either. And, and one of the things to bear in mind about the, the satraps is that the satraps, while they're typically you know, they're termed as, as governors of the Persian Empire and the satrapy is a province, they wielded powers of kings within their satrapy. That's how big and powerful the empire was, is that a portion of it was as strong as a, a major kingdom. So Tisaphernes had a lot of wealth to uh, throw around. So did uh, Pharnabazus. But when they, they had the proposal in front of them, this is uh, roughly 413, to decide where, with the Athenians suffering terribly uh, outside of or inside of the Syracuse's Great Harbor, and that's the whole expedition is going to come to grief very soon, they decided to go with the proposal from Tisaphernes and fight in Ionia. Uh, instead of heading straight for the Hellespont, which is where all the food was coming from. And they wasted a long time, several years before they decided to actually take Pharnabazus up on his offer. To Saphernes, a very interesting man, very shrewd, very astute. He effectively played the Spartans against the Athenians, giving the Spartans just enough money to keep their fleet in being and battle the Athenians without either side winning outright. The idea was is that if both sides are fighting to exhaustion, the Persian Empire itself is protected. Thucydides credits Alcibiades, the uh, Athenian general, with you know, giving Tisaphernes this advice. And maybe he did give that advice, but it's certainly not a policy that Tisaphernes could not have come up with on his own. So they ended up wasting a lot of time waiting for Tisaphernes to bring the promised Phoenician fleet up, because most of the empire's navy is actually Phoenician in, in origin, Phoenician crews, Phoenician ships. That never happened. I find it interesting that like you're reading the story and it's like the satrap, the Persian satrap, he is kind of fighting or pitting them against each other, trying to wear them out. And the Peloponnesians are kind of just, the Spartans are just kind of going along with this. Mindaris, I think, is the admiral at this point, the naval arc. It's the more experienced Syracusan ships who are starting to get frustrated with Hermocrates. Um, whereas like the inexperienced Spartans were just kind of like, just willy-nilly naive and at this point i think the corinthians hadn't really put out a lot of ships of their own but it's like the experienced syracusans who defeated the athenians with their general hermocrates a few years earlier and they're the ones that get frustrated uh, because they have the experience in naval fighting now well it was hermocrates who actually was most vociferous in his criticism of tersaphernes and his policies and i think the syracusans who showed themselves to be very capable very professional they, they were the ones who were most disgruntled by essentially not being treated properly by Tisaphanes. I think they saw through the subterfuge. After a while, you start to you have to start to wonder where is this Phoenician fleet that's always been promised and never shows up? Where is our money? They were supposed to be uh, subsidized, but they were never getting the kind of money that they had been promised. They're never getting the money that actually would have made them into the kind of force that could have walloped the Athenians. And it would, it would seem that. Tersaphernes had in mind the idea that I'll support the Spartans, the Peloponnesians, enough to keep Athens, to keep them in the war, right? but not to defeat Athens outright, because one thing that the Persian policy would not have wanted would have been a Greece dominated by one or the other, which then could have struck at Persian territory and would have been a greater danger. And in that regard, for several years, it, it uh, certainly did lead to the weakening of the you know, Spartan position during the Ionian War. And there's a lot of you know, false starts, fits and starts. And the Athenians showed an amazing ability to pull themselves up off the mat after suffering terrible defeats. One of the, and so in the aftermath of the uh, failure of the Sicilian expedition, they're, they're out of ships. Their coffers are really depleted, but somehow they're able to put together a new fleet, fight hard, and they were able to do this you know, first because of the maladroitness of the Spartans and the hazard payments being made by 
the Persians themselves under Trisaphne, but also because the Athenians still had nautical skill. They, they knew how to fight at sea better. They practiced maneuver warfare and better than the Spartans ever did. And because of that, they were able to emerge victorious in uh, battles that alter the balance of power. Do we know how, like, what their drill and practice regimen was like? Do they drill every day, the rowers, during the war? Well, sometimes the Athenians would make movements simply to give their rowers practice at the oar. And the more you're actually rowing, uh, the better you're going to get. But the Athenians were always practicing, were practicing before the war ever broke out and raised their skill of their rowers, their oarsmen, to a very high standard, much higher than anybody else, excepting perhaps the Corinthians, for instance. Because they had more practice, they could do maneuvers that others just could only dream of. So, for example, to go back in time a little bit, if you go to uh, 429 BC, it's the Gulf of Corinth, and there's the Peloponnesian fleet that's going to be taking part in the invasion of uh, Akronania. It's intercepted by this 47 ships in this Peloponnesian fleet, and they're outfitted not for a battle at sea, but as a, an invasion force, so they're weighed down. They're intercepted by a 20 trireme strong squadron under the Athenian admiral Formio. So it's all Athenian ship. There's only 20 of them, right? Formio is a brilliant officer who dies relatively soon after his moment of glory in 429. He, he comes upon the ships. The uh, Spartan fleet forms something called a kuplos, which is a formation in which all of the triremes are pointing bows out. So they're, they're presenting their rams to an enemy all around defense, but it also immobilizes them. So Formio, with his 20 ships, rows around them, and this phrase will be repeated, but it's, it's a li he literally rows circles around them, and uh, each time they're making feints inward at the Peloponnesian ships, and these feints cause the Peloponnesians to lunch up, they're huddling in, and each time this happens, the kuplos gets tighter and tighter and tighter, until finally, this is, now this is happening at night, and Formio has great intelligence about what's going to happen. He knows that the wind's going to shift and when morning comes. So morning comes, and that's when he strikes. He takes all of his ships, at, and they really clobber the Spartans. The Spartans get away, and there's a waiting game afterwards, all right? So uh, the, as the Spartans are trying to be enforced, Formio gets no reinforcement. So he's still left with just uh, 20 ships as, as the Peloponnesian fleet is reinforced. Yeah, so that's the battle. It's, it's called the Battle of Chalcis. The ensuing battle of Nalpactus is when the 20 ships under Formio are making a movement along the northern shore of the Gulf of Corinth, and they're heading back towards their base at Nalpactus. They're chased by the Peloponnesian fleet. The last nine in the line are captured and beached, and the, but the 11 are able to escape. The 10 that make safety inside of Nalpactus. The last one, the 11th trireme, is being chased by a single Peloponnesian trireme that's gotten out ahead. So the rest of the Peloponnesian fleet is following at a very leisurely pace. They're singing the Paean, which is their victory song. And so there's a, a merchantman anchored right outside the mouth of now Pactus Harbor. So ten of the Athenian triremes are in the harbor, right? And there's this one last trireme that is passing by the merchant. So this last trireme effectively uses the merchantman to set a pick. It maneuvers around the merchantman. The pursuing Peloponnesian trireme can't respond as easily. And as it comes around, it hits this trireme, it rams it, and sinks it. And seeing this counterattack leads the ten Athenian trireme. It, it heartens them. They then issue forth from now Pactus Harbor and go on the offensive. And the Peloponnesians are taken completely by surprise. They think the battle's over. They think the battle's won. And Formio is able to uh, get back all of the ships uh, and uh, sink several others of the enemy. And it, it's just a, a brilliant move. So in two battles, he, he shows that the superior rowing skill of the Athenians it, it enabled them to snatch victory out of the jaws of defeat. I want to circle back to the Kuklos that you talked about. That was used at Artemisium as well. Do we... Is that something that was kind of considered an old-fashioned defensive maneuver? Because I don't really remember reading about it much later in the Peloponnesian War. You're correct. The, the idea of the Kuklos was that by presenting the bow of your ship to the enemy, you gave him an unabiding target of having a ram-on-ram -ram attack. So that the idea is it's very defensive in origin. They didn't like hitting rams because that can cause damage equally to your ship as well. And what, what happened was uh, later when the Corinthians discovered that if you strengthened your prowess, you could do prow-to-prow -prow ramming and do more damage to the Athenians who had lighter ships for faster maneuvering. I'm, I'm not aware of the Kuklos being used 
again, as the, the Kuklos, the, the thing about the Kuklos is that to use it means that you are giving up all ability to maneuver. It's a pure defensive huddle, which at sea is a very difficult thing. It is probably chosen by the Peloponnesians at the Battle of uh, Chalcis because they were a fleet that was outfitted for like an invasion fleet, but not so much a, a fleet ready for battle. That's probably why you don't see it after that. And you see it earlier uh, in Artemisian. One of the things that should be borne in mind, and this is one of the interesting things about the differences between the Athenians of the Peloponnesian War and that the Athenians and the Greeks of the Persian Wars, is that in the Persian Wars, the skill of the, whether the Athenians or the other Greeks, was relatively poor. They were interested in fighting battles not of maneuver, but of boarding. They wanted to fight, board, and battle that way. It was the Phoenician sailors of the Persian fleets that had greater skill. But because the Athenians and the Greek fleet had stations itself at Salamis, the Persian fleet got bunched up, had no room to maneuver in such constricted waters. And that's why the idea of fighting in narrow, restricted waters gates tactical skill, negates rowing talent. Which is what you'll see a lot later in the war where uh, when people are uh, trying to fight the Athenians, they're trying to get them into a narrow space to negate their maneuverability, their superior triremes and skill and or, uh, helmsmen and or, oarsmen and stuff. Uh, so, like that, instead of getting the, into the the uh, what Thucydides calls the old fashioned way of war. That's right. In fact, Thucydides saw the Athenian way of naval combat as as the superior way. That is, you needed room to maneuver, but with superior rowing skill. You could uh, maneuver rapidly enough to to ram an opponent either uh, in the sides or in the stern. You didn't have to go very fast to inflict a damaging strike on an enemy trireme. Skill also was important because the rowers needed to be able to back water, which was actually to distract the trireme from the target that they had hit. Would one hit of the ram do it, or would you have to hit it multiple times? From the sources, one time would do the trick. In fact, one of the things that the uh, ramming was that the worry was about over-penetration. That is, you didn't want to put your ship so deeply into the side of the enemy trireme that you couldn't get out again. So the design of the ram was actually meant to prevent over-penetration so that you could get your ship. Because if your ship was stuck in another ship, you were fighting a boarding action no matter what. But what the Athenians wanted is they wanted to hold an enemy ship allow it to flood with water, and then go and find some other ship to hit. So they didn't really sink ships, right? They just kind of disabled them? That is correct. Uh, the trireme, it had, weighed about 40 tons, which is not a lot considering that it had a crew of 200 and its size, but it maintained a positive buoyancy so that even when it got cold and flooded, it'd sink low in the water. Rarely would it ever sink. What that meant was is that after a battle, these crippled triremes could be uh, taken in tow, captured uh, by the victorious fleet, and refurbished. The thing about the trireme, and I think this is probably a great time to actually get into the trireme, is that it's a very sophisticated piece of technology. It doesn't really have any analogy that we will find in later naval warfare because it was not like the ship of the line of the 18th and 19th century. It's not meant to duel with really stout uh, sides that are made of oak. It was very light. It was very swift. It was propelled by its oarsmen in battle. The, the he- sails were taken down and oftentimes left ashore. What the trireme benefit was is that, like the ironclad of the 19th century, it could maneuver without regard to the wind, unlike the ship of the line, which was relying upon the wind and the weapon of the trireme, the great weapon, was first it was the trireme itself with its ram, and also the soldiers it carried. So ramming and boarding were the two tactics. For the listeners, I'm pretty sure they already know, but trireme, it's because they have yeah, three decks with three rows of oarsmen. Like trireme that. is the is the anglicization of the Latin word triremus, meaning three-oared, of the Greek term for trieres, and that meant that it was rowed at three oars. That is, there are three levels of oarsmen, the thranites at the top, the zugioi, in the middle and the thalamites in the bottom. So, so you would have had uh, loads of oars popping out from each side. Each man had an oar, 170 rowers, so 85 to each side. Was that like a like from the the top, middle to bottom? Was that kind of like a social structure? I don't know if it was a, a social st- structure. Presumably, I'd prefer to if I had to row, the, I'd be in the upper level, maybe where you had air. The size of the trireme 
the Thranites were, were open. And they were vulnerable to strikes if someone could actually sail up and toss a javelin at them, which is what the Syracusans did in the Battle of the Great Harbor for Terrakeen. They got in little boats and they tossed javelins at these unprotected rowers. And, and once again, you know, the, the source material, I wish you could ask some more questions here and there, but the source material says that during most of the 5th century, the rower made three obols per day. There were six obols to a drachma. And the drachma was considered to be a good wage of a skilled craftsman. When the Peloponnesian War starts, the wage of the rower is now one drachma per day. And so they're nicely paid. But it also meant that crew of a trireme was very expensive to pay. And so it was very expensive to operate a trireme for any length of time. That is, over a 30-day month, it would cost a full talent, or 57 and a half pounds roughly, of silver, 6,000 drachmae, to keep the 200 sailors and hoplites and other uh, soldiers uh, fully paid. So 200 was the number per trireme. So you had 170 rowers, oarsmen, uh, and, and mind you, these are idealized numbers, but you had a full complement of oarsmen. 10 epibatai, who were the marines. You had four toxotai, who were the archers. And the balance were the various sailors that if you were the ones who actually operated the mass, or the triarch, who was the ship's captain. For example, the Calustes, who's sometimes called, translated as boatswain, kept the rowers in, in time. And you had the Kubernetes, who was the helmsman, the pilot, who actually like, directed the ship in balance. Yeah. So the Marines, they're essentially just hoplites, right? Did they have like different equipment or was it just what a normally a hoplite would wear? They were hoplites at sea. The, for example, this, the same held for the Romans. That is, if you, you hear sometimes about the Romans using Marines against the Carthaginians and the Punic Wars. Those were just the generators who happened to be on a boat. So these were hoplites. They were, they were there in case the two ships got knocked together and had to fight to either repel borders or to capture another ship. The fact that the Athenians would put 10 hoplites on board was indicative that they were not hoping to actually fight boarding actions. There are instances where other navies would sometimes put more, sometimes as many as 40 marines on board, if they really wanted to use boarding as a actual battle tactic. Would you put more uh, hoplites on board if you were planning on doing raids? I think that you, this is where the source material is lacking. It would make sense to perhaps put more Marines on board a particular trireme if you're going on a naval raid. On the other hand, it would probably have been more efficient to transport an even larger number of Marines on a specifically made crew transport. Yeah, that makes sense. So 200 with 170, do you know where we roughly got that estimation? We know that there was a 200 rowers altogether, or rather I should say 200 on altogether because Thucydides says that each rower was making the same amount as the hoplite and they're all being paid the same. So the 200, so it would cost 6,000 drachmae per month. And we know that the numbers of the various types of rowers on board, but where exactly that comes from, I don't know exactly. I don't want to point to anything. But the actual number uh, was 200 as specified by Lucidity because he was trying to explain how much this cost. And not all rowers made the same, right? Because they started hiring like kind of like mercenary experienced rowers, maybe not Athens, but other city states as well. This is where, once again, the source material can be lacking. I wish you could ask another question about how much they were making. So, for example, Thucydides, in his history, explains how much it costs to keep an entire crew of an Athenian trireme paid. So you've got 200 oarsmen, hoplites, archers, what have you, all on board. It costs a drachma a day per man. And over 30 days, that would all work out to be, uh, for an entire trireme, 6,000 drachma or one talent per trireme. So it made the, the math relatively easy to do. But we also know that later on in the war, there's a halving back to how much the Athenians were at least were paying back to three obols, and there also seems to have been competition between various, say, Athenian triarchs as to hiring crewmen. That is, you would have to offer more pay to a particular oarsman to get your ship filled up, because all of this was in the hands of the triarchs. So uh, you can imagine that if you're a triarch that wants to make sure that your ship is fully crewed and is therefore fast because you've got a full complement of rowers, you're probably going to have to offer a bit more money to get them on board as opposed to uh, leaving maybe a quarter of your ships empty. And a, a true arc is not necessarily someone who has got that position from experience, but it's it was one of the uh, the liturgies or liturgia that one of the wealthy in Athens bankrolled. It was one of the most expensive ones. But uh, yeah, you you basically paid for the fitting, the prices, the uh, the building of the ship, and it, was it was it essentially like their ship, or was it kind of like renting out a ship? That all depends. It seems that that the job of the triarch was to make sure that there was a crew on board, that the crew got paid, 
and then all of the ancillary equipment, the supporting equipment that a trireme needed, ropes, oars, the anchor, the sails, the mast, that those were all taken care of. So while the ship might have been built by the state, he handled everything else and made sure that it was ready for battle. He would often captain the ship, and then he would hand the duty over to the next trireme. So this was not something that would last forever. He would pay for it for a season, and then he would hand uh, the stuff over. And one of the benefits of the triarchy system is that it was an informal system in which the triarchs were able to make sure that they had the equipment that they and their ships needed without needing to get the government involved which not have had, I think had the wherewithal, at least the parcel everything out as needed. So how did the chain of command go if there was such a thing? Well, the, most, the second most important person on the ship, considering he was steering the ship, was the steersman, or sometimes also referred to as the helmsman or the pilot, and that's the, the Kubernetes. A skilled Kubernetes was the guy who made the ramming strike really deadly. Was he also someone that might have been drawn from the feats, or was that more of like a privileged, wealthier position that was kind of like an officer? Probably he was not from the lower class, but he was, he was certainly a skilled person, a skilled uh, sailor. Darn our lack of sources. <laughs> right. We have some nice things, but not everything that we could possibly hope. So you have the true arc, the helmsman. Were there, was it the boat swans? Or the, I'm sorry, the, the bosun? Is that what it is? It looks like boatswain, but yeah. That's the, the translation for Calustes, who is the one who made sure that the rowers were kept in time and rhythm. Because imagine you've got 170 men with oars. They're all pulling. They all have to pull in unison together. So he kept the time for them. How did they keep the time? And that's interesting. For example, sometimes what they would do is that they would call out the phrase was in Greek it was oh oh pop oh oh pop that was their call to uh, keep in time does that mean anything I don't know what that means and sometimes when they wanted to go faster they would say ripapai or re right? that is they would have a little call out to the crews that made sure that they were all rowing in time when stealth was required and sometimes keep time by tapping stones together there was a very important there was a sonic element to battle at sea so for example there's a, the Spartans would tell their uh, sailors, be quiet so you can hear what our Calustes is saying. We need to be able to get our orders out, keep your voices down so everyone can hear. And in cases where confusion became so great and everyone was shouting for their lives, that was frightened. No one could hear any orders. And that was an example of where man would fail because if you can't communicate an order effectively, because you've got hundreds of men who are screaming. There's no way that you're going to get much out of them. And I remember uh, Thucydides specifically talks about that with the Battle of Rium with Formio and back to the Kuklos, the chaos that it, that it caused. That happened, that, that kept the Peloponnesians from uh, effectively responding. I know like Assassin's Creed Odyssey isn't very good with naval warfare, but did they like just shoot normal arrows or did they actually put like fire arrows and shoot at each other? I, I think that fire arrows are more of a Hollywood kind of thing, which doesn't mean that fiery missiles were never used, but the, the source material is what it is. And arrows. How effective would arrows have been on a ship? I mean, they, there was javelin throwers too, right? Like some of them threw javelins. There, there's no example of archery or any kind of really missile combat being the decisive factor in a naval battle. I, I have a feeling that to the extent that any of these battles can imagine trivially constructed is that th there were approaches to contact, ramming. Someone might have thrown javelins or shot arrows as the ship's near. But the damage was done by the ram couldn't get away, then there may have been a boarding action fought for possession of one of the ships, but that it wasn't a, a matter of some form of missile doing enough damage to cripple the ship. Okay. So back to the trireme for a little bit. Do we know, so they got a lot of their timber from like Macedon and other places. Do we know how much roughly one trireme would have cost to put together? Do you know how long it would take to build a trireme, like the process of it? it it's conjectural as to how much a trireme would have cost, but I've seen figures saying that it might have cost about two talents which would have been, uh, a talent was 57 and a half pounds. And when they say talent, they're almost always of silver. So something around two talents to build, now that, generally speaking, a cost that was borne by the states just Athens. So they were costly. Or in Athens' case, the, the tribute states. The tribute is actually an important thing about that. Getting to the question of building ships, war galleys of the ancient world were actually relatively quick to build because we have many, many instances where Fleets were put together in, in 60 days or 90 days or something really fast, like large numbers of them. And that was primarily because they were built all to the same patterns, it seems. That is, the Romans certainly built to the same pattern by copying a Carthaginian trireme that they captured in the, the beginning of the Punic War. And I think that for a lot of these ships to speed production, 
everything was done in a mass production sort of sense, that these were not, they, they, as much as possible, they were probably trying to build according to the same plan, the same fittings, the same sizes of timbers and things like that. So a fleet could be put together relatively quickly as long as you had the materials to hand. Were they built in the Piraeus, or is that just where they ended up? So, but they were definitely built within Athenian territory, and Themistocles also would bring uh, gave relief from taxation to skilled shipwrights to attract them to Athens because you needed or this right before the uh, second Persian invasion, you needed them there to actually build the ships. So the construction of the ships could be done relatively quickly, and we have examples of fleets being built in a short amount of time. The Athenians certainly managed to put together a number of ships in the run-up to the Battle of Arganusai. It was, so it would seem that, yes, you could build ships quickly. Have you seen the the modern reconstruction? Yes, I have. I think, I think it's brilliant. I think also it's helped to, because they've they built a replica, and, and mind you, a modern replica is never going to be 100% accurate compared to what you would have had before. But I think that, generally speaking, you can say that the Olympias, which is a ship of the Hellenic Navy, which was built in the 1980s, and in that period of the 80s and 90s, they conducted several tests rowing it to see how it might have performed. The the remarkable thing about the Olympias is that it shed light on so many different aspects of ancient naval warfare, and and it confirms a lot of what we knew. So, for example, it confirms that speeds that are tested to in uh, ancient Greek sources could be achieved by the crew of the Olympias. And the Olympias crew didn't have necessarily a, a professional crew. Many of them were people drawn from whomever was willing to sit and pull at an oar, but they were able to achieve sustained speeds of six and seven knots. They could actually go faster if they were doing a sprint speed, which is what may have been used in battle for perhaps for ramming, things like that, of maybe nine to ten knots. One of the interesting things that fascinated me was the Hellenic Navy did tests on how long it would take to get a full crew aboard the Olympias using two gangplanks and moving at the double. And they were able to get a full crew on in, I think it was uh, 90 seconds oars out, really fast. Oh, wow. So they were able to get their full crews on really quickly. So what that shows is, and because there's so many instances in uh, ancient naval warfare, and especially in the Peloponnesian War, uh, crews not being able to get back onto their ships in time to get them off the beach and out to sea, that it wasn't how long it took to physically get aboard a ship that was the problem. It was how far were these crews wandering off that they were not near their ship to actually get on board, put out the oars, and you know, drag it into sea. So, for example, if you look at the very end of our period, Battle of Potomy, something of an anticlimax because the Athenian fleet was pretty much ruined still on the beach. And most of the ships did not get out to fight Peloponnesian and Navar Lysander. That was because the Athenians had parked their ships in such a terrible location. There was no food around. They allowed their crews to wander far afield to go find food. When Lysander sees this and he finally comes out to fight, the Athenian crewmen are nowhere near their ships to actually do the battle. So there's an aspect to ancient Greek naval warfare that is simply finding food, making sure that your crews are near their ships, being ready to fight. It's often overlooked because the, the World War II equivalent of what happened with, say, Egospotomy was like warplanes being caught on an airfield. That is, an unready to fight. They, they're, they're an airplane parked in an airfield, it's not in the air, is useless. It's, that's exactly what would happen, for example, that battle. So when they would, a trireme would put out to sea, did they take any like provisions with them, like for a day or two, or was everything found when they would stop along the coast and find things? The amount of food and water that you could actually bring on a trireme was very limited, because the trireme itself had a large number of men aboard compared to its size, so its cargo-carrying capacity very limited. So the, the way that the fleets preferred to move was they preferred to move along a coast. It's not that they couldn't cross open water, but they preferred to move along a coast and reduce movements across open water to a minimum if they could. And one of the benefits of staying along the coast was is that they could beach their ships. Now, beaching a ship meant that you take the ship up and haul it ashore. It took about 140 men to haul the ships ashore. And the men would get out. So they would stop for lunch allow the men to get off, take their meal for lunch. Then they would haul the ship back in, cruise some more, row some more. And then at night, what they would do is they would haul the ships back up, have dinner, and allow the ship dry out a bit overnight. When it, when they were traveling, the question about food is that often a fleet admiral would request of a nearby town or a city 
who would say, will you please establish a market somewhere outside of your walls where our men could get some food? Which is where the, the Sicilian expedition failed before it even started. They had a lot of trouble actually finding food for themselves. Now, a lot of cities that were happy to supply moving fleets because you can imagine that even a modest fleet of 30 triremes would have 6,000 men, hungry men, coming ashore that you could have uh, sold a lot of food and made some nice money. So establishing a market was more or less take your, your food merchants, vendors, outside the city walls, sell the food, and then they'll be off. There, there, some Greek fleets were supplied with food that they actually brought with them. And this is why, uh, once again, the source material will often be lacking on certain things, whereas the Sicilian, Sicilian expedition, we know that it was accompanied with triremes. The actual warships were accompanied by a, a cloud of merchant ships of all sizes. They were bringing food, too, to supply the uh, fleet. And we can probably guess that at any one time that merchant fleets, that rather military fleets, were being tailed by merchant ships, things like that, that were trying to do business. Uh, there probably were also support ships of various sizes that might have been performing reconnaissance or just for whatever uh, reason. But especially when you get into uh, Xenophon's Hellenica, and it talks about how many ships the Navy had or what have you at a certain battle, it's, it's just the numbers of triremes that are mentioned. The, 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 the ancillary warships are not described. Oh, why didn't they just take Whenever they would go out to on campaign, just fill up a bunch of transport vessels with supplies so they didn't have to stop and look for food. That's an excellent question. It may, and, and right now I'm conjecturing, trying to use what I would consider to be, well, what could you have done if you put food on board a ship? How long might that fresh you know, food might have lasted? So we, we can't be certain that they didn't send some ships along with a moving fleet, but it's probably simpler to have the ship, the, the fleet beach, get food wherever they were. Because you need a lot of food and deal with it that way, which is why paying the oarsmen, paying the crews was so vital. I always find it interesting, like you were talking about the Battle of Aegispotomy. Uh, there's several battles throughout the war where both sides get just completely caught off guard while their soldiers or sailors are out getting food. I guess that's a larger point of some of my frustrations. It doesn't seem like a lot of their generals didn't really like learn lessons from throughout the wars. I think you're bringing up the point that they seemed rather amateurish at times. It would probably indicate that it is exactly that. You would hope that there would be more professional attitudes, that they would actually have reconnaissance ships moving ahead, someone to signal that an enemy was approaching. And maybe the ships were there, maybe just it's much harder to spot an enemy at sea than you would think. But they were very vulnerable when they were ashore. It also happened during the Punic Wars. That one example where a Roman caught ashore only managed to, to survive long enough by getting out to sea to fight back. There was a Carthaginian fleet that was caught in at the Battle of Japana for that heroic efforts by the Carthaginian admiral was able to get his fleet mustered and out to sea. But surprise is a real thing when it comes to these battles. I would say that the main answer that I would give is that there was a level of amateurishness there that was never truly avoidable. So, for example, sometimes just generals would make mistakes. And, and Aegispotomy is a classic example of that. What would happen is, is that Lysander, who's the Navarre now in the year 405 B.C., and one of the truly great commanders of the Spartans in the Peloponnesian War, he holds tight control over the entirety of his fleet. He's sitting there in uh, Lampsacus. He's taken Lampsacus. This is in the Hell's Pond. And he has all of his men close to his ships. Whereas the board of generals that's commanding the Athenian fleet is part of Strategoi, they're allowing their, their men to go wherever they can to go find food. They're not close by. That's because there's no food close by to have, so they have to eat somehow. What Lysander does is, because he has a stronger command and control of his army, no matter what the skill levels were relative between the Peloponnesians and the Athenians as of 405, if the entirety of the Peloponnesian fleet is combat-ready and deploys against only a relative small portion of the Athenian, most of which is caught on the beach, the Peloponnesians are going to win. And I guess we should point out, too, that the Athenians shot themselves in the foot there by executing some of their best generals the year prior to this. That's a great point bringing up. And in fact, that's that even goes back to the whole question of that the Athenians at the very, even towards the end of the war, still demonstrated their superiority in uh, naval combat. So at the Battle of Argonusai in 406 BC, the Athenians have no ships, they've got no trained sailors, but they managed to scrape together enough money, build ships, put together a new fleet with whomever was willing to pull an oar. So they meet the Persians at uh, Arganusai, sorry, the uh, Peloponnesians at Arganusai, and win. 
and it's a great victory. What happens is, is that a storm is coming up. So after every battle, you have these crippled triremes, men have fallen over, rowers in the, in the water. A storm comes up, and there's still a fleet of about 50 ships in the vicinity. The uh, Athenian generals say, we've got to leave. We can't stay to collect all of the, the bodies of the dead or those who survived. How realistic was it that they were going to even collect any bodies of the dead? It would just be survivors, right? Because the bodies of the dead presumably would sink to the ocean floor. Not necessarily. Some of them might have been floating. Uh, it, it's, it's hard to say, but it, it seems that they were both you know, corpses, possibly. If you were not, if you're not wearing armor, you probably floated, but the hoplite might have sunk because he's wearing uh, heavy armor. But they were survivors, and they were also dead, and they didn't stay to collect them. And that was a violation of religious taboo among the Greeks. So then what happens is that despite winning this battle against all odds, the Athenian generals, the ones who were brave enough and foolhardy enough to go back to Athens, they're put on trial, and they're found guilty by the assembly. Six of them are executed. It's often been given as a, an example of democracy run amok or radical democracy. It's also been used as an example of that the rowers would have come from the lower classes, the thetes of Athenian society, whereas the strategoi, the generals, would have been drawn from the upper classes. And maybe there was some sort of class resentment that they left these men to die. Uh, I think that they had an extremely rational excuse for why they couldn't stay to collect all of the bodies afterward or all the rescue everybody who caused the storm, which might have wrecked the entire fleet and left Athens bereft of any defense. But the six admirals were executed. I mean, and Alcibiades after that was no longer basically ever going to come back, even though he, he had been exiled and came back. And then he's just kind of on the outs again. They basically had nobody that could stand up to Lysander at that point, And they just decided you know, just shoot ourselves in the foot. The Alcibiades actually did make an appearance right before the Battle of Aegispotomy. It's 405. And he warns the Athenians. He says, you're in a terrible position. Move to Sestos, which is a nearby city. You'll find food there. You can keep watch on it. But they decided to stay on the other side of the Hell's Pond, which was effectively a beach and nothing else there. No food. He even said, look, I have some mercenaries, Thracian mercenaries. What I can do is I can mount a land attack on the uh, Peloponnesian fleet and we can combine ourselves, but he's told to shove off by the Athenian general. Now, Alcibiades, by this time, had a very checkered career. Brilliant general. He's, he's much better than he's given credit for, even though I don't think Alcibiades ever did anything that wasn't 100% great for Alcibiades. But uh, the main limiting factor on Alcibiades' actions when he comes back to the Athenian, in particular when he is accepted back to Athens, he's reinstated after his period of exile, and he's given command of the Athenian fleet, is that he never had enough money to actually accomplish much. That is, much of what he was doing was effectively piracy, that he was going around grabbing money from whoever he could to continue the war. That's not the way to actually run the war. So he's finally told to leave by Athens because of the failure at the Battle of Notium, which was actually, he wasn't present. He was lost by his helmsman, takes the fleet out and manages to get everything messed up when he's fighting Lysander and his very trained, very disciplined Peloponnesian fleet. Alcibiades could have helped the Athenians to at least avoid disaster at Aegispotomy, but by this time, he's not trusted. You can imagine that things were very personal back then. You're dealing with urban politics at its best and all of the, the fights that go on in a city where everybody knows everybody else. And the way Plutarch makes it seem, it's like you have these now inexperienced generals because their most experienced ones are no longer alive. Alcibiades gives them solid advice and they're like, no, we got this. The Athenians just showed, by the by Athenians, I mean the, the generals that were commanding, they had uh, 10 generals there. Extreme incompetence because they put themselves in a terrible position in Aegispotomy. And they also managed to ignore uh, excellent advice. Now, one wonders if it had come from someone who was not named Alcibiades, would they uh, listen to it? Uh, it? It's very difficult to say. That being said, there's one point that has to be made concerning the superior command and control that Lysander had, the greater effectiveness of the Peloponnesian Navy relative to the Athenian Navy at this point of the war. The big change comes, what really is the decisive factor in turning the tables decisively against the Athenians is when Prince Cyrus the Younger, he's the, a, a, a prince of Persia, he's the younger son of Darius II, who's the great king. He, he takes control of the maritime provinces of the Western Persian Empire, and he's taking control of the direction of the war. He gets on very well with Lysander. They become best buddies. Uh, so he's now in control of the disbursement of money to the Peloponnesians. And unlike Tersaphanes, he is extremely generous. He turns on the spigot for his friend Lysander, and he's able to not only pay the Peloponnesian fleet fully, but even when they get trounced after Argonusai, he's able to help subsidize the 
building of new ships. It's the it's the introduction of Persian subsidies on a large scale once Prince Cyrus comes in that really changes everything because then the Peloponnesians can suffer defeats and then come back as strong as they were last time. They can pay more rowers, fill out their benches. For example, simply by uh, making the wage of the Peloponnesian oarsmen four obols as opposed to the three obols that the Athenians were getting, all these extra rowers who were probably clustering around there, they all go to the Peloponnesians because you can make more money. Persian money definitely helps in the, or the last few years of the war. I mean, they even Farnabasis even rebuilt a brand new fleet after Sinosema. Right. The intervention of the Persians in a serious way via subsidies was what tipped the scales. That's what it comes down to. That's why, for example, when I, I talk about my book, A Naval History of the Peloponnesian War, Ships, Men, and Money in the War at Sea, money is a huge deal in this war. And one of the things that gets ignored is why the Persians decided after the failure of the Sicilian expedition, so the Athenians are really you know, hurt, to come in in a big way against Athens, which they could have done beforehand. Now, it may have been that the Spartans were not sure what they were willing to do, but sometime around 415, the Athenians intervene in some way with a rebel, a, there was a Persian rebel named Morgis in Caria. Well, he's got the city of Iasis in Caria on the western coast of Asia Minor. He's actually a, an official of the great king. He goes into rebellion. The Athenians gave some sort of help to him that so incensed the great king that he decided that he would now intervene with money. That was really what tipped the scale. If you were to sum up like the last, after the peace of Nicias, basically the last two decades, it's the Athenians did everything they could to lose. <laughs> they pissed off the Persians. They <laughs> sent two massive fleets to Sicily. They executed their generals. They got rid of Alcibiades, then brought him back, then got rid of him. And the Spartans, as Thucydides put it, were the best people that the Athenians possibly could be at war with um, because they let them get back into it. And it wasn't and it was ultimately Persian money in the end. I agree. I think that what's your capsule version of why Athens lost? And once again, I really do believe that the Athenians triumphed in the first half of the war, the Archidamian War. And you can consider that a victory, that it was a triumph, a maritime strategy that the Athenians had as elucidated by Pericles. Now, Pericles, of course, is gone after the first few years of war. He comes to the plague. They don't have his wise direction anymore. But even though Athens suffered heavily from the plague, and Sparta and the rest of the Peloponnesus didn't, they, they still managed to triumph by ringing the Peloponnesus with naval bases from which to harry Peloponnesian forces. They ignored Pericles' advice to attempt no further conquest. Now, by further conquest, he didn't mean capturing a city on the coast of the Peloponnesus and setting up a base. What he meant was is that avoid the crazy talk that's going around Athens where you're going to conquer Etruria or Carthage or Sicily. Because there'd be a lot of people who were talking about the Athenians really thought they were something else. They thought that they were going to be able to conquer these very well-developed, wealthy, powerful states. And he's warning them against that. But what happens is, is by 415, the Athenians have recovered from the plague. There's a new generation that's grown up. The wealth is flowing in. They're getting a lot of money in tribute from their various allies, as you want to call it, but they're really subject states at this time. Sicilian expedition, which was completely unnecessary. They had an enemy still extant in Greece, and they sent a huge fleet to capture Syracuse. And you have to wonder how they thought that that was actually going to benefit them, except that they thought that it was going to be easy. My analogy for that is I compare it often to the attack by Nazi Germany against the Soviet Union in 1941. They thought that defeating the Soviet Union would be an easy thing, but they hadn't accomplished the defeat of Great Britain. So Great Britain is still there. It turned out that the war against the Soviet Union was much harder. In the same way, Sparta was still alive and well, and the war with Syracuse was much more difficult than they ever could have imagined. Thucydides is, says that, oh, they didn't realize how big Sicily was. It's like, well, you guys were just there a decade ago. Was the newer generation just that naive? Did they get persuaded by Alcibiades that easily to think it was going to be that easy when you were just there a decade ago? Granted, Syracuse didn't have a navy at that point, but you're not going to conquer that island. <laughs> But, um, you know, as an aside, I, I actually have an episode. It's called Carthage Enters the War. And I pretty much just think of their fight with the Syracusans as part of the Peloponnesian War has gone Mediterranean. It's just kind of a continuation in my mind. So I incorporated that into the scene as we go on because their entrance pulls the Syracusans out of the east, which is, I think, a big factor as well that allows the Athenians kind of to come back. Well, I think it's in 409. 
But yeah, that's just an aside. Do you recall when this is going on that there is more than just Greece out there? There's obviously Persia. Then Athens even tries to get Carthage as an ally, which, you know, that might have been significant if that happened. I mean, they were allies, but they never sent any anything to Athens at all. <laughs> like, It certainly is an interesting what if. And that's one of the things about any sort of historic event. That is, what if this happened? What if that had happened? How might this have changed? It would seem that getting back to the point of why did the Athenians want to undertake attack on Sicily is that they had had success for so long that they really thought that they were invincible. And they just didn't think that Syracuse would have proved to be that difficult an opponent. See, I think that it was a terrible idea to ever attempt the Sicilian expedition at all. Obviously, with hindsight, knowing how badly it went. They definitely, like, tactically made some stupid decisions that if they made other decisions, they could have defeated Syracuse. Even if they, say, took the city, they weren't going to be able to hold it realistically for very long. The, just the logistics of that would have been impossible. It, w- it would have been extremely difficult to hold it. I think that the best chance that they had of taking Syracuse was at the very outset of the campaign when Syracuse was not well prepared. It would seem that if they were going to have any chance of actually capturing Syracuse, strike immediately and see what happens. And once it became a matter of a long siege, what killed them was then they literally trapped themselves inside the Great Harbor. They forsook all of the advantages that an Athenian fleet would have, which is it's got superior rowing skill, better, faster ships, but you need room to maneuver. They got into uh, fights where you were just in a slugging match where once the uh, Syracusans, taking a page from the Corinthians, realized that you could just use prow-to-prow ramming tactics to disable Athenian ships in a crowded area, their days were numbered on Sicily. They lost so much there. And I think what it meant was that not only did they lose the cream of their fleet, their city, their manpower, but what was perhaps most damaging about Sicily is not even so much what they lost, but because it now gave confidence to all of their enemies to say, Athens is, let's restart this war. And that's what Sparta did. And once they restarted the war, then the Peloponnesian fleet starts to get built. They find a Persian subsidizer. The hell spot is now in play. As an aside, have you ever been to Syracuse or Tegia? No, I've, I've been to Italy. It's be- A, it's beautiful, obviously. It's, Sicily is an awesome island, but it's like you sit on that little island and you just look into the harbor and it's like, it's kind of mesmerizing to like think of like how many of those ships <laughs> were in that harbor during those battles. And it's like, man, there was like very little movement taking place. There are about 200 ships all told inside the harbor area when you take both sides into account. There just was not enough space for the Athenians to do what they needed. And they could not get their ships out of the water regularly because they didn't have enough ships to stay on guard so that they constantly soaking up water. And that's one of the things about a trireme that I should also point in mind. They're made out of fur, which drinks up water. So that's why they always had to dry them out. If you can't dry your ships out, not only do they start to rot, but they also get very heavy because they're waterlogged. So a heavy waterlogged ship is not going to maneuver as well as a lighter ship that's been dried out properly. There was a lot of innovations in those couple of years, too, just because of the tight space. And again, fascinating. Some of the things they did with the dolphin. I don't actually know what the actual Greek word for that is. Uh, and then they had the, the divers that would like dive underwater and try and cut up these spikes and stuff and arrow shooting. It's just an interesting, uh, interesting time period. Uh, a lot of naval innovation. Right. The, the dolphins were intriguing because what it was is you were using effectively gravity to damage the enemy by dropping a chunk of metal on And that also shows up, what it shows you is that triremes, once again, not like Nelson's HMS Victory, triremes were fragile so that a big hunk of metal dropped from sufficient height could potentially penetrate the deck or go through the the hull. Also to bear in mind is you had to get really close to use something like a dolphin. So that was used in the fights inside the Great Harbor of Syracuse. What that brings up is that naval warfare, Greek naval warfare, it, it was amphibious warfare, that these ships were not cruising all that far from land very often. Most fights were taking place very close to land. And if you backed up your ship into a harbor, let's say, and the other ships had to actually come close, that meant that if you hang something off of a yard arm or throw a heavy stone, that would work pretty well. That leads me to ask, you said it took about 90 seconds to get on the ship and whatnot. How long would it take them to, like, if they backed up to a harbor to, like, get out of that harbor? I don't know. It would seem that the question of how long would it take to get your ship to sea, it could not have been too long because... A ship could have been pulled off of a beach and put to sea by its crew complement, well. in fact, not even its full complement. The, the major limiting factor, and remember, these ships, as they're rowing, even if they're doing a sprint speed, they're moving at maybe nine knots an hour. 
right? So let's just say 90 miles an hour. These are not moving very quickly. So you see them from a far enough distance, you would think you'd be able to get all of your crewmen back aboard a ship, at least out to sea uh, safely in a relatively quick amount of time. I think that is true. So the fact that so many times that didn't happen, whether it was at Noshim, whether it was at Egospotomy, would mean that the crews were just too far away. They were doing other things, eating food, getting food, sleeping, whatever. And they would only be rowing if they're like in combat areas, right? That depends. It depends on if they wanted to give practice to their rowers as they're moving. So they could row. If you could row at a steady pace, you could actually do that for a significant period of time. The sail was there to take the burden off of the rowers. So the trireme had two sails. It had the main sail on the main mast and it had the boat sail on the boat mast. Boat mass was smaller and raked forward, but both of those were taken down when battle was in the offing. They were just useless weight, so they were often left ashore, either taken down or left ashore if they knew battle was coming. Interestingly, the Greeks didn't try power sailing, that is, uh, the idea of rowing with the sail up. You would think that that would speed the ship along, but and you could do that, but the problem that they discovered was is in modern recreations is that it was not worth the trouble because you were moving so fast and the wind was blowing you here and there that what would happen is is that you couldn't actually keep all of the war the oars on each side in time. And one of the there's a bunch of battles that talk about like uh generals try and get the enemy to row against the wind. I think Formio did that a few times. There's a lot of winds that came down from the northeast. So it makes it makes sense when you think about it that way. When I first was reading uh, some of the battle narratives or the campaigns, it's like why are they sailing north just to go south? <laughs> it's like because they're trying to catch winds. <laughs> and oftentimes movements of the kind you uh, mentioned were done because they knew that they'd have to put ashore pretty quickly to, so that they always could take their meals. So when they're making the Sicilian expedition, they actually first moved up north of the coast of the Peloponnesus, the uh, Balkan coast, before they crossed over to Sicily and then came back down south. Less time you can stay away from a coast is, is preferable. That is correct. You could make lo- long distance movements. Especially with the triremes. And the merchant ships can go away from the coast more, I believe. The crew of a merchant ship was much smaller compared to the size and mass of the ship than was the trireme. The trireme was all about combat. That's why you had so many rowers on it. The, the rowers were not there to operate the ship in the sense of the, the sails or anything like that. You were there to make sure that you had the ability to maneuver while you were in in battle, and that's why you had so many on. So do we know much about naval discipline in the sense like punishments? I'm not the person for that. Just as an aside, one of the interesting things about Greek naval history is that we have lots of, relatively lots of material about Athens, how they ran their fleet, because they had their triarchs and they had their lists and things survive on inscriptions, but... We don't know all that much about how other Greek states did that. It's not necessarily clear how much you can infer from the Athenian practice to the practice of other Greek states. Also, a lot of the material that we have concerning the, the Athenian Navy dates from the 4th century, which is not the Peloponnesian War. We're, we're limited a lot by our sources. What I also think is, is Ryan, is, and you've probably seen this already, no one is really producing in the ancient world a genuine military history. They may write about a war. But it's not a military history in the sense that we would write it now if we're writing about, say, D-Day or North African campaign between Rommel and Montgomery. These are very high-level diplomatic histories where typically the only named commanders typically are generals. You wish that you knew more about who uh, lower commanders were, what it was like, what they experienced, and we don't have that. There's no, like, I'm trying to think if there's any version of Band of Brothers. I don't know. I mean, we do have Xenophon's uh, Anabasis, but I don't know if that would count. You get a little bit of understanding of the people around him, but it's still Xenophon's telling you what he wants you to know from his perspective. So it's a, it's a lot like, uh, and I made this comparison in the, the last guest episode I did, is Xenophon reminds me a lot of like Julius Caesar. It's very like specific in what he wants to talk about to put himself in the best light. <laughs> yes, I agree with that. I, I, mean, I only tangentially mentioned the plague that struck Athens. But it struck me how interesting the Athenian plague was because it had never been seen before. Thucydides that says that it originally came from Ethiopia and then made its way through Egypt and then through the eastern Mediterranean and arrived at Piraeus. But it mainly hurt Athens. It didn't really hurt anybody else. Athens got walloped and it didn't do much in the Peloponnesus. Now, one of the reasons may have been the Athenians had brought all of their people in into the city and there was like a shanty town in many areas and they were you know, living in close quarters with people and their animals and things like that. But the remarkable thing is that Athens got really bad, but not their enemies. It's very difficult to try and pin down what the disease was at the removal of 24 centuries because sometimes the symptoms that are created by the first appearance of a disease in a virgin population 
differs from what the symptoms are when that disease comes back again and that population has some sort of knowledge of it, that is, the the immunity, antibodies, whatever. It did hit some places in Arcadia, though, because they did build that, like, famous temple of Apollo at Basai. I I guess it hit, struck a village really bad there. So there was little bits of pockets. But yeah, yeah, I agree. It's... I'm assuming that Athens was basically the traitor in Egypt, if it did come from Egypt. I don't know if Corinth was going. I think Corinth was more west still at that point. Didn't they basically just get like zoned out of the east by the Athenians? There was a lot of competition for their trade. So and that's one of the reasons why the Corinthians hated the Athenians. They, they were the ones who said to the Spartans, you've got to go to war. you got to go to war. The Corinthians are barely mentioned at all at, in the second half of the war. As the war goes on, you're saying, wait a minute, what happened to all of these allies that they had? Now, either they were there, but they don't really get mentioned, or they kind of took a back seat, because it really did become the Spartans and, I guess, whomever they could collect. Really, really interesting how that all came about. It's, it's a fascinating war. And as long as you've got Thucydides, and, you know, it's brilliant work that he did, that he created. It still holds lessons for policymakers. Not everybody reads it and gets what's supposed to be gotten out of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It takes a close reading. Yeah, yeah. This is this is a fantastic conversation. I hope I did a good job. Uh, when I was putting together a lot of my episodes, I knew very little about like the like terminology of like ships and stuff. So like people are like, the cat heads got changed on the ships. So the triremes, the Corinthians changed the cat heads. So I was like, the hell's a cat head? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it, it's okay. No, it, 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 it's, it, it's quite all right. It's quite all right. It happens, you know, uh, but it, it is remarkable stuff. And that actually is something that, because I titled this A Naval History of the Peloponnesian War, I really think that the Peloponnesian War was a naval war. That is, almost all of the battles were naval fights. The decision was found at sea. That the most important things that occurred were somehow related to maritime operations. So in the first half, the seizure of Pylos, the surrender of that's factoria. The battles of Delium and Mantinea, you say, how, did they have any effect on the war? Not really. And, of course, the real reason why Athens was in the Ionian War is because, finally, their last feast, is the fleet is defeated, and the uh, food from the lifeline to the Black Sea and all that food is stopped. It's choked off, so that's why they lose, and it, that's a naval war. Me being an Air Force person, I would tell you that it's all about air power and less about land and Navy at this point. But uh... <laughs> Right, right, right. No, I, I completely understand. You know, back in World War II, Arthur Harris of Bomber Command really believed that they could win the war, he could win the war with his heavy bombers. And the American generals, half on people like that, you know, two East Bats, they all thought that uh, they could win the war if they just had enough bombers and enough time. They could win the war. Well, of course, you need aircraft carriers now, too. You don't want to be flying from wasting fuel. <laughs> right. I mean, I guess you could say that Japan was defeated by air power, but not entirely. The thing is, is that, generally speaking, uh, a naval battle could lose you a war, but it was not going to necessarily win you the war because you have to seek decision on land. Is that where people live? So you know, after the Battle of Trafalgar, still had to fight Napoleon. Right, on land, you have, to, you have to have the Battle of uh, Borodino and Waterloo. The, the Civil War, they uh, were able to blockade the South. They still had the different Confederate armies. So in that regard, the Ionian War is something very different because Athens imported food. So I, I, this, was, this was a lot of fun. Uh, I, won't, I won't take up your time now. Um, but uh, yeah, I had a lot of fun with this. Thank you. Um, if, if the listeners can um, want to follow up on your work, you do you have a website? My material on Amazon. I'm the author of Rome Seizes the Trident. A Naval History of the Peloponnesian War, and I'm the author of the science fiction series, uh, the Memnon War series. Check it out. It's on Amazon. Mm-hmm.